right, well, uh, thank you all for coming to this Engineering Themes lecture. Um, this lecture series was established to honor individuals who had played major leadership role in and made significant contributions to society through working in areas such as technology, engineering, mathematics, and the science. So I'm going to let Professor Soha Hassan to tell you how our speaker today best exemplify the intent of that lecture. So what? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to invite and host Jim here today. I have to start with a joke. Right, Chris? Jim and I were neighbors. I grew up in the state of South Dakota. He grew up in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> in South Dakota, that is considered a neighbor. <laughs> we're, we're culturally very close together. <laughs> That's exactly the line. Culturally, we're very close together. So Jim went to uh, undergrad in mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota, where he focused on computer-aided design. In uh, Minneapolis, he worked uh, in several companies, and one of them was um, Metaface Technologies, and he was the CTO of that company. He also co-founded a Minnesota-based company called Windshield Technologies, and that company was eventually acquired by PTC in uh, 1998. And I guess that's when Jim made it all the way out to the East Coast. <laughs> Uh, at PTC, Jim serves as President and Chief Executive Officer, focusing on driving the company's global business and operations. And one of the distinguishing things that Jim has done is actually focus the company on technologies and capabilities that drives his company to be a leader in the space of IoT. Um, for me, I've gotten to know Jim's work through some work that he has published in the Harvard Business Review, and students from my Internet of Things class have come in contact with those articles. Jim wrote two very influential articles on how smart connected products uh, can transform products and can transform companies, and that work is very highly cited and very exciting to read. And for us at Tufts, when we started, Mark Hempstead, when I started working on designing our IoT course, the articles that we read were really uh, helped us focus on the fact that smart connected things are not just really cool, but you really have to put them together in a meaningful way to add value to society and to companies. Um, Jim has received many awards. Uh, he was recognized at IoT CEO of the Year by Postcapes. He was Technology CEO of the Year by the Mass Technology Leadership Council and received the CAD Society Leadership Award for his work on the Internet of Things. He has given multiple talks in many places and he's also been quoted in many, uh, many, uh, in the press. Uh, including Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, and uh, Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, Jim does a lot of good things to society. He is, serves on the advisory board at the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering. He also serves on the board of directors of Sensata, the world leader in automotive and industrial <coughs> sensors. He also serves on the advisory board for uh, the National First for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, and he was recently recognized as the, as the top 100 CEO leaders in STEM by the STEM Connector organization. So, Jim, we're very honored to have you here. Thank you. Well, well that was uh, that was quite quite an introduction. You didn't miss anything, so uh, that was great. All right. Well, uh, thank you all this morning for this uh, chance to come and talk to you about what I'm working on, what our company's working on, uh, and what we're thinking about, because we think we're at a pivotal moment here. Um, certainly in the world of manufacturing, because of a kind of whole new concept of products, but uh, these products, of course, get deployed into medicine, into agriculture, lots of different places, and we see uh, you know, profound implications. So if I just start here, you know, the, the basic uh, concept of the two papers I've written with uh, this other professor from Harvard, um, is that uh, you know products are changing and it's changing the value chains of companies who uh, both make the products and then who operate those products and it's causing everybody to kind of step back and rethink what are the new possibilities now before I go into it I was asked to tell you a little bit about my story 
uh, how I got from uh, farm boy to CEO. So I was born in rural Minnesota, you know, where there, uh, where there really were very, just very small towns, uh, you know, very small schools. My graduating class was 65 students, for example, in high school. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm. First uh, was born on one and then later uh, as a teenager worked on others. Um, but I think that became my maker lab because I was exposed to so much equipment and so many problems and you know I knew all about you know why an engine wouldn't start when it wouldn't start and how to rip it apart and put it back together and so forth. So this combination of being good at math and science and having some mechanical aptitude uh, landed me uh, in a mechanical engineering program. Um, now along the way I got to like computers and in fact some days I thought maybe I should be in computer science because I actually liked that so much and it was a it was a nascent field then as compared to now like floppy disks actually existed and were floppy before they were smaller and not floppy anymore. Um, but uh, I decided to focus on this intersection of engineering and computers which of course led me to things like computer aided design. I also by the way met my wife at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my wife uh, was getting her bachelor's degree when I was. She went back and got her master's degree in mechanical engineering, then her PhD in mechanical engineering, and then uh, when we moved out to Boston here, she went over to Harvard and got an MBA as well. So uh, she's uh, very well educated, and the two of us, you know, probably know more about engineering than you know any other couple that lives in the town we live in, for sure. Um, what happened is I got a job working for a software company with engineering software. And I started as an application engineer, helping people figure out how to use the software and get value out of it. Of course, I would criticize the software frequently, like, you know, I don't understand why you built it this way. And so before long, I was uh, recruited to be a pr product manager and then ultimately the head product manager. You know, if you, if you know how it should be done, well, then you take over. And uh, I did, and then from there, I became a chief technology officer. Uh, one day in the mid-90s, I was playing with the internet and web, and, and it just struck me that the way we do this would change dramatically if we started from scratch and did it on internet and web technologies. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about how engineers work in teams and those teams tend to be distributed around the world and so forth. So uh, I took the company I worked at and said, we have to do a hard pivot here. We have to rethink this product we're building um, that we just sold to Ford and we just sold to Boeing and a bunch of other people and we need to go back to the drawing board. And then I realized it wasn't practical to go back to the drawing board. Everybody wanted us to add things to the next release, not start all over. So then I said, you know what? Uh, this is my entrepreneurship moment. I didn't have any idea how to start a company. No idea whatsoever. I was 28, um, pretty good application engineer, fair uh, CTO, but I walked out the door and quit and recruited a couple of the smartest guys I knew and we started the company. Um, I could probably write a book about all the mistakes, but nonetheless, in the end, this company is very successful and this year we'll do $600 million in revenue in that, uh, in that technology I started uh, way back then. It came to be that I was acquired by PTC, a Boston-based uh, software company, formerly known as Parametric Technology Corporation. We invented 3D CAD with a famous product called Pro Engineer 30 years ago, now, uh, now known as Creo. Uh, PTC acquired this company and I stayed because my business was booming and I was you know, committed to it. Uh, I became the CTO of PTC and then the COO and then ultimately the CEO uh, back in 2010. It's been a good ride. Uh, some amazing things have happened since I've been the CEO. The market cap of the company has uh, quadrupled. We're a public company. So uh, we're now worth about $5 billion, about 6,000 employees around the world. Um, work with 30,000 manufacturing companies, so the, the who's who of the manufacturing universe from uh, Toyota and Hyundai to uh, you know, Airbus and uh, Embraer to you, know, you pick any industry, John Deere and Caterpillar, you know, I could bounce around uh, medical devices, you name it. Uh, so that's been a great uh, experience. Now I never really uh, lost my roots, I'm still a farmer. Uh, fed the cattle this morning. Turns out later I'm going to talk to you just briefly about how I'm in the process of connecting them to the internet for sort of a <laughs> biology slash technology experiment. They're, I have two, uh, two cows who are quite pregnant at this point in time and, you know, kind of wish I had a better way of monitoring them and so forth. So that's a, that's a discussion for later. But anyway, there's my background, uh, how I got from farm boy to engineer to uh, CEO of a fairly good sized company. Okay, now everybody makes fun of me at work. In fact, uh, <laughs> there's a magazine called CEO Magazine, and they ran a spot on me, and 
And uh, one of the photographs that was in the article uh, ended up getting edited a little bit, and somebody had the uh, cow in there photobombing and so forth, so it's just, just for fun. Okay, so back to, to, to what I've done. I, I worked uh, quite a bit with this professor, Michael Porter, a very famous professor from Harvard. I met him years ago when he used to be on our board of directors before I was the CEO. He and I got to know each other and then stayed in touch even after he uh, retired. And we wrote two articles, kind of was almost like one very long article if you put them together. But the first article was about how uh, the nature of competition is changing, that this is a very disruptive technology and uh, it'll change the way companies uh, compete with each other. And then the second article we wrote was uh, to talk about uh, how it will actually change the work of companies and actually their org chart, their structure of companies will change because the old structure doesn't really make sense in the new world. So I'm going to tick through those two articles just at a high level and then tell you a little bit about the third one we're working on, which we hope will be published in the next couple months, which is the human experience. Because in the first two articles, we argued that uh, physical and digital are converging, but then we had the observation, but the human, the way humans engage these converged products generally is either purely physical or purely digital, and maybe the human experience will change here too. So we've done a lot of work, particularly in this field of uh, augmented and virtual reality, which I'm going to give you a, a peek into uh, as we get into it here. So let me start at the beginning of the first article, and I brought this fun little prop. This is a uh, smart connected tennis racket from Bobolot. Pretty much looks like, feels like any other tennis racket. But if you look uh, down the bottom, there's uh, a port to plug in the battery and so forth, because there's a little battery and a circuit board inside the uh, handle here. And in fact, there's a uh, three-axis accelerometer and electronic gyroscopes. You're getting X, Y, and Z forces in attitude, pitch, and roll motions. And that's basically all you're collecting. There's no sensors on the strings or anything. But by taking the hardware, you know, the physical thing, adding the sensors and the software, and then communicating that up to the cloud. This, by the way, is a Bluetooth device. So it goes from the tennis racket to the phone and from the phone to the internet. Um, so by connecting that up to the cloud, we can then, in a database, gather that match, plus every other match you ever played, plus every other match that every other player played, and we can begin to run analytics. And analytics are important because most people uh, can't divine much intelligence out of X, Y, and Z forces or attitude, pitch, and roll. It's just hard to get from there to good players and bad players, good swings and bad swings. So analytics can tell us that, and then we can use uh, application platform to go build some applications. Uh, we might build an application for the player to do a self-diagnostic. We could build different applications, you know, of their game, different applications for the coach. The coach is looking at a team, and he wants to compare the team members to each other, and possibly this player to their best competitor, and so forth. You could imagine the league, the, uh, the, the sports center, you know, many different potential uh, interesting uses of what are fundamentally two sensors in the handle of this tennis racket. So it, I use this as an example to say the world of tennis rackets actually changes dramatically. In fact, uh, for Bobolot, this, as I understand it, was their first tennis racket. And if you could imagine the process of building tennis rackets before they were smart and connected, and then afterward, after they're smart and connected, it's radically different. Think of engineering goes from pretty basic mechanical engineering of a simple product to actually quite sophisticated uh, engineering now, systems engineering, uh, lots of software engineering here and lots more up in the cloud. We're gonna have to figure out how to run a cloud infrastructure. Oh my God, a tennis racket company trying to figure out a cloud infrastructure. I mean, that's a big, big change. But suddenly now the vectors upon which we compete are very, very different. You know, uh, if you're comparing a dumb tennis racket to a dumb tennis racket, I'm not that much of a tennis player. I'm not sure how you really differentiate. I'm sure there are points, but they're pretty subtle. If you compare smart to dumb, it's radically different. You've just broken through a kind of a plateau, if you will, and gone to a new level in, uh, in product differentiation. Now, whether it's a tennis racket or a, or a piece of heavy equipment like John Deere might make, same story. So it turns out it's tennis rackets, it's, uh, it's appliances in your house, it's your car, it's your Tesla. I mean, all of these products now are being built in a very different way. And uh, that's kind of the first point here is that we're, we're, we're now crossing a line where there are fewer and fewer pure mechanical products. I mean, we've had pure mechanical products since, uh, you know, since a man learned how to chip a stone to turn it into a tool or something like that. But um, just in the last 
okay, 40 years if you go back to NASA, but if you really say, when did it hit mainstream? When could you buy something like that? You know, it's the last five years, really, that we have uh, fewer and fewer mechanical products. Okay, so um, the basic concept here now is that the pipe of data coming at us is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and this is not PTC proprietary data here, but uh, there are comments like 90% uh, of the world's data has been generated in the last two years. And what I'm saying is that IoT is a massive source of new data. If every tennis racket is streaming data at you, every smartphone, every chair, every light in the room, every everything is streaming data at you, then you have more data than ever. And so I like to think of this as the pipe coming at us, coming back at humanity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and in fact, this projection says that by 2020, there will be uh, 70 zettabytes of data. Zeta is uh, 10 to the 21st. So think of that as uh, 18 orders of magnitude more than a uh, kilobyte or, or uh, 15 orders of magnitude more than a, than a uh, megabyte and so forth. Lots of data. Um, now, one of the things we can do, and I described it in this tennis racket example, is we can parse that data a little bit to get down to what's interesting to know. Um, what's, what's interesting to know is swing mechanics. Um, not so much uh, you know, X, Y, Z, attitude, pitch, and roll forces. So we can apply analytics. Now we can also apply analytics to your Tesla. We can apply analytics to your uh, washing machine and dryer in the laundry room. We can apply analytics to practically everything, to my cattle, to understand when the birth moment is approaching. Because I don't have a sensor, I don't have a birth sensor. But by watching how other sensors change over time, I can begin to see patterns that correlate to we're approaching the, the big moment here. Maybe I ought to tell Jim. And so uh, we see like uh, four kind of categories of analytics you know, that we wrote about in the paper. Descriptive analytics that tell us what happened. So what, what combination of attitude, pitch, roll, X, Y, and Z was a good swing? What was a bad swing? Was it even a swing? Or did they just drop the tennis racket on the ground? We can figure that out. Uh, we can do a diagnostic analytic to try to say, why did that happen? You know, if uh, A begot B, wh what was A? Why did B happen? Help us understand what A was. We could do predictive analytics, which is uh, sort of the example I was saying with my cattle being pregnant. You know, there's a pattern developing here that is consistent with the pattern that other cattle show shortly before they deliver a calf. I think we're now, and that pattern might be two weeks long or one week long or a day long. So we can begin to tell you sometime in advance that it looks like we're headed down that pattern. And I think I know how this story ends, so I want to bring it to your attention. It turns out that almost all mechanical things fail with a pattern too. Um, you know, bearings don't just fail. They, they get hot, they vibrate a lot, then they make noise, then they fail, right? But that's a process that could take days or weeks from the first onset of the, uh, of the um, you know, different readings to the actual failure. And then finally, prescriptive analytics would be actually tell me what to do. Don't just tell me what the problem is, but tell me what to do to prevent the problem from happening in the first place. So uh, this is an interesting way to take that data and put it to work. So now that we have data and analytics, we can monitor. You know, we can monitor a patient. We could monitor my cattle. Um, we could control. You know, we mon monitor a tennis match. Um, we could control. Now, it's hard to control a uh, tennis racket, but you could imagine this thing vibrating like your phone does to tell you you're doing that bad habit again. Please be mindful of it or something like that. Uh, optimize, you know. We certainly want to optimize the tennis game. We want to optimize the productivity of a big capital asset in a factory or, or in any kind of industrial infrastructure. We want to optimize the uh, birth rate and success, not, not so much the rate, although that's another uh, angle, but because it turns out there are certain times when you <laughs> cattle need to be bred, and it's important to know that too. But, but also the birth success to make sure you know it's coming and you're there and, and ready to deal with it. You know if there's a problem developing and so forth. And then finally, uh, the last level would be automate, which is to start allowing things to make their own decisions, to apply their own algorithms and start controlling themselves. Now, we're all uh, probably familiar with the concept of autonomous automobiles that's definitely headed our way, but there's lots of other autonomous things uh, coming our way. Um, you know, factories, for example, are becoming very, very autonomous. Uh, where they're starting to make their own decisions about how to optimize and get more value and more productivity and more throughput and so forth. So I think we, we uh, Professor Porter and I viewed uh, autonomy as like the holy grail. 
and even within autonomy, there's degrees of autonomy. Uh, I might argue that the vehicle I drive has some degree of autonomy already. It's got uh, uh, active cruise control that keeps me from coming up too fast behind somebody. It's got lane keeping that keeps me between the stripe lines. So it has a degree of autonomy, but I need to be ready to take over because it, the, the degree of autonomy it has isn't fully trustworthy yet. But nonetheless, it's, uh, it's already up there in the uh, automate sort of category. Okay, um, now it isn't just one product. What we also realized is that when you think of products sending data up to the cloud and taking instructions back, they could affect each other. And so uh, we modeled this example loosely based on John Deere, who used to make purely physical tractors. Then they put software in the engine and in the cockpit display. Um, then they connected it so they could understand if you needed to change oil or service the engine or something like that. And then they had this bright idea that actually machines in a family could share information with each other. So the example here is that the combine harvester at the bottom, that's the equipment that uh, you know, threshes and reaps the grain in the fall, so gets the seeds out of the grain in the field, that uh, if, you, if you watched a combine harvester operate, the productivity varies significantly as you move across the field. There are dry spots and wet spots and, you know, uh, places that need more fertilizer and so forth. So if we could record the productivity by each area in a very large field, by each fairly small area, then in the spring, when we use the tractor in the tillage equipment that works the soil, that tends to also apply fertilizer, we could have variable rates of fertilizer, and uh, we could also put the fertilizer in narrow strips. But we gotta remember exactly where we put the narrow strips, because when we come by and come by on the next pass with the tractor and the planter, we want to land the seeds in the strips we fertilize, not in between, or we'd be fertilizing the weeds, not the rows of crops, and that would be terrible. But the net of all that is you could get much more output, which is to say uh, harvested grain, with much less input, which is to say fertilizer, and, and maybe you do the same thing as you'll see in a second with irrigation and so forth. But that's uh, John Deere, and John Deere has this capability, by the way. To me, it's like your, your Apple uh, iPod, iPad, iPhone, iMac, whatever, all know who you are. And if you download a song to this one, it becomes available on that one. And it's sharing a lot of digital information. So you don't actually have um, a full independent product. Part of the product is yours, your watch, your phone, your, your whatever. But part of it is shared between multiple products up in the cloud. So again, it's a very interesting uh, kind of breakthrough in, uh, in how you think about products. Um, you can take that to a next level now and start talking about systems of systems. You know, if you start thinking about smart cities, there are many, many smart city things going on. And there's a, uh, there's a security infrastructure for a city. There's an electrical infrastructure for a city. There's a water and sewage treatment infrastructure for a city. So if I were a city planner thinking about a smart city, I'd be saying I got all these systems and there's optimization within the systems, but I'm actually trying to optimize across systems within something that's very, very complex, uh, like a city would be. Part of the, uh, part of the uh, observation here is that the boundaries between these stages are getting a little murky. You know, is John Deere a tractor company or are they a farm automation company? Um, and in fact, that's a question they struggle with because there's sort of a slippery slope. Like if I'm making smart tennis rackets, should I maybe make other smart uh, sports equipment and possibly uh, exercise equipment and think of myself as uh, I'm actually a human fitness company? And this is merely a vehicle to achieve human fitness or, or am I just a tennis racket company and I'm gonna stay away from smart golf clubs and running shoes and, and everything else. So all of this uh, brought us, we believe, to, uh, to a new set of uh, strategic questions which product manufacturing companies have to think about, and these are questions they by and large haven't thought about before. So which capability to pursue? There's so many things that could be done right now, but many of them don't create value. So you can connect anything up to the internet and monitor it, but what's the point? Um, how do you create value? Because everything uh, incurs cost, and of course, if you have cost, you need to have even more value. So what, what capabilities are really worth going after? I think we had an example of a, of a a company that makes uh, water heaters, and they make uh, commercial water heaters like you'd find in a campus like this or in a hotel or, or hospital, and they make residential water heaters. And it turns out that hooking uh, commercial water heaters 
to the internet is highly valuable because when they fail, you got a big problem. You know, no hot water on campus today, sorry. Uh, that impacts lives, you can't really cook in the cafeteria and clean up like they plan to and so forth maybe. Uh, but in your house, would you pay to have your water heater connected to the internet? Well, water heaters fail once every 12 years. So sometime in the next 12 years, for a moment it would be useful. But most of the rest of the time it won't be. You would never pay for that. That's an example of uh, that trade-off. Second thing is, uh, what should you do in the product versus in the cloud? Uh, and there are, there are advantages, technical advantages, to processing information locally at the edge, as we call it, or processing it up in the cloud. Um, like, for example, are we trying to do analytics of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the sensor readings in the handle of this uh, tennis racket, or are we trying to stream the raw data up to the cloud and let the analytics happen there? I think it's probably mostly in the cloud at that point. Now, flip side, I always tell people, please don't put the anti-lock braking al algorithm up in the cloud. Because when I hit the brake, I don't want to get, you know, sorry, network's down or something like that. I mean, you know, it's got to be right now in the moment, fail safe, fail proof, you, you name it. Okay, the third thing is, uh, should I have an open or closed system? Should I make it possible for anybody to write apps that talk to this uh, tennis racket? Or should I have a proprietary connection? Now, before you say everything should be open, because that's the altruist, altruistic view, um, let me point out that none of Apple stuff's open. It's the most closed network of products in the world. It's virtually impossible to tap into that. In fact, I don't know if you guys have tried this yet. You can't just write an app and put it on an iPhone. Do you know that? I mean, you've got to take it to Apple, petition, petition to them, have them review it. And there's a lot of apps they say, no, I don't want that in that ecosystem. You're not allowed to put that there because there's only one way to get it, and I control it. One way to get it there. Uh, now, John Deere, for example, thinking about all this equipment working together, is thinking the same thing Apple does, which is if you bought one of them and the value proposition were closed, then you're likely to buy all that equipment from me, right? But somebody also come out with an open source tractor product system, I suppose, and compete against them, we'll see. Okay, the next question is uh, technology development, how much to insource or outsource? Uh, what we've seen is many companies um, believing their powers here are much greater than they actually are. Like probably a tennis racket company thinks they can build that whole cloud infrastructure and figure out analytics and so forth, only to realize they can, but it costs too much and they move too slow. So this great idea is actually imperiled by being sort of too, too greedy, if you will, thinking that all of this can be done yourself and not building an ecosystem. Uh, question number five, what data to capture? Again, you can capture many types of information. Um, so what is worth capturing? And then what is worth processing locally versus sending up to the cloud? For example, you could process accelerometer and gyroscopes readings locally and send swing data up to the cloud. Or you could just send the raw data up to the cloud and process it. These are things you, uh, you have to think about what to capture and where to process it. The next piece is uh, how to protect yourself while you're doing that. So who's allowed to see this? I mean, I think a lot of competitive tennis rackets, tennis players, would say, I sure hope my competitor can't analyze my game every time I use your tennis racket. Because if that could happen, then I can never touch this tennis racket again. You know, it's actually a security breach for some pretty uh, important data. Uh, step number seven is, would you think about uh, disintermediating that network that stands between you and your customer? A lot of companies sell through distributors or resellers, also do service through distributors and resellers. Classic example here is Tesla versus the automotive industry at large. Automotive industry at large has dealers who sell and fix cars. Tesla doesn't. They sell and fix them directly. Now, there are pros and cons to that, but for a lot of people, the problem is they have a dealer network today that they're dependent on. And even if they could envision having one, not having one in the future, they're a little reticent to go to war with the one they have today because they have to get from here to there. So it's a, it's a big business challenge brought on by a technology opportunity. Uh, question eight, should you change the business model? Uh, a good example of that is one of our customers uh, who makes medical diagnostics equipment, uh, uh, a company called Sysmex, builds machines that analyze blood and urine. So like if you went uh, to the doctor and they pull the sample and then they go test it. You know, should we sell the machines and the consumables or should we give them the machines and charge them per test? That's kind of an interesting business model question because a lot of hospitals will welcome your machines in the door if there's no capital purchase and they're just paying by the test. 
Because actually, that's how you bill insurance companies is by the test. So the, the fear would be I buy the machine and I don't get enough utilization of the machine to amortize through all, enough tests to pay for the, the cost of owning the machine. But if you can flip the business model around, sort of like Uber did, then that's a very interesting uh, new possibility. And then uh, step number 10, or question number 10 is, or I'm sorry, I skipped nine. Nine is, uh, should we think about secondary uses for this data that are interesting? Um, for example, uh, you know, uh, people want to put sensors in automobiles to inform the insurance company about your driving habits, but we also learn a lot about traffic patterns and things like that uh, at the same time. So there are many cases where there are secondary uses of the data which are extremely valuable, potentially, um, if that data is repurposed, but we gotta be careful so as to not offend the people who gave it to us, not realizing that we were gonna use it you know, for, these, uh, for these different reasons. And then question number 10 is, should we expand the scope? Should we think about uh, moving from tractors to uh, product family or, or even beyond that to a bigger solution, system of systems type solutions? Okay, so those were 10 questions that uh, Porter and I raised in the first article. Uh, if we switch gears to the second article, uh, where we talked about how will this change your company, I'm just going to cherry pick a few, uh, you know, and I'll start with uh, engineering and product design because, um, you know, this is this is where most of you are coming from. Uh, so the first thing is this idea of uh, low cost variability. So traditionally, products might come in different price points, different capabilities. Those had to be mechanically, physically different. But now, by flipping bits in software, we can actually expose different capabilities or, uh, you know, like for example, the, the, the uh, John Deere example here is derate an engine. Used to be, if you purchased a John Deere tractor, you could buy it at four different levels of horsepower. John Deere was making four different engine blocks, four different pistons, four different rings, four different everything, and then carrying all the spare parts for all of those things for the next 30 years. Somewhere along the way, they said, why don't we just make the bigger engine? And with software, uh, derate it three more levels. So by just tweaking software, I can sell you the 50-horse engine, the 60-horse engine, the 80-horse engine, or the 90-horse or the engine just by flipping bits in software. I could also sell you upgrades. If you buy the low engine and decide it's not a big enough engine, then I can just turn it on to a higher level or, or an even higher level yet. Very interesting idea because variability is what the consumer wants, but from the perspective of the manufacturer, it's a very bad thing. Um, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I'll share a quick little story. I once said, uh, we, we did a very big project with uh, Nokia. Anybody remember who Nokia was? <laughs> Nokia wanted to be able to give you your phone of choice. So we were helping them do uh, what they call features and options. So basically, uh, you'd sit down, tell them what they want, and then they would manufacture a custom phone for you. And uh, when the Apple iPhone came out, which ultimately killed Nokia, it came in, uh, I believe, two colors, black or white, and two memory levels, like at the time, maybe eight or 16 gigabytes. That's it. Because the variability all shifted into software. Because if everybody pulls out your phone and compares them to each other, they're all different. But the difference isn't so much in the hardware, it's in the software. And so by shifting the value prop from hardware to software, we made variability easy, because we're not adding manufacturing processes and spare parts and inventory and so forth. So there are huge uh, opportunities. The second thing is uh, evergreen designs. So uh, manufacturing has always been a one-shot premise. You, you engineer the product, you manufacture the product, it leaves the factory and you never see it again. Um, and therefore you got to get it perfect. And, and you know, changes come in batches. You know, the brand new uh, model year of your favorite automobile is vastly different than the previous one, but then it won't change for some years. And that's because rolling in these changes was expensive and so forth. But if the variability shifts into software and we can update the software algorithms, then we can change the product even after it leaves the factory. So the whole concept of discrete manufacturing starts to be questioned a little bit. You know, discrete used to mean there's a start to the process, there's an end to the process, you're done, okay, and now on to the next one. But when are you done uh, with your Tesla? When are you done? Probably, you know, it changes periodically. Um, new features come, bug fixes, etc. It's never done. And so there's a whole new notion now of, uh, of uh, manufacturing processes being evergreen and things you can continue to change and improve. And now you start thinking about roadmaps as opposed to model years and so forth. 
Uh, the second example is new user interfaces. And uh, that's not a particularly good one, but it's, uh, it's one from my house. I have a swimming pool. And uh, when they installed it, um, they forgot to give me a control system. There was supposed to be a panel on the wall, you know, to control uh, is the spa on or off, is the cleaning, cleaning sequence running, is the, what temperature is the pool heated to, and do I want it on or not, and so forth. I said, where are the controls? And they said, oh, we, for, we forgot to install that. Now it'll be hard because in the meantime, we've closed up the walls and so forth. Can you just use the iPhone app? And I said, OK, let me try it out. So that's not a particularly good app, but it's the only way I have, actually, to control my, uh, my swimming pool. I don't have any other way. Kind of interesting that you can sort of remove a whole subsystem around that embedded control panel and so forth. And then the next thing I'd say about product design is uh, this bicycle example. You know, Boston and, and most every other major city now has these kind of uh, bike rental things uh, everywhere. And uh, it just strikes me, if you look at those bikes, they're very different from anyone I ever owned. And that's because they're actually designed for a business model. They're designed for the idea that you're not going to own the bike. We don't need to make it sexy. We need to make it durable. It needs to be connected. We need to know where it is. We need to be able to load them and unload them easily as we're repositioning them. It's just a different design for a different business model. Um, the function's still the same, which is take somebody from point A to point B, but the business model's uh, completely different. So these were some examples of how engineers need to think differently, and there are many more. Um, if we switch uh, down to manufacturing, there's a lot happening in the world of smart tools and smart work instructions. This example is uh, pretty crowded here, but it's an airframe and Airbus coming together. And it is a bowl of spaghetti when you're in there. And if your job is to run a cable harness from here to there, you've got to take it through all the right nooks and crannies, through all the right uh, lightning holes and so forth, apply all the right fasteners. So using um, smart work instructions, we can take you to the right place. We can program your tool, tell you which fastener to drive, and then record in the quality database that that fastener was driven and to what torque. Now we're building a quality record as we go. That's one example. There are many others. Um, there is a whole new level of manufacturing automation happening in factories. Uh, in the U.S., we call it smart manufacturing. The Europeans tend to call it Industry 4.0. Uh, the Chinese call it Made in China 2025. But what's happening now is we're saying we could actually integrate across dissimilar cellular automation systems. So in factories today, when you buy automation equipment, it comes with a proprietary controller that controls that one piece of equipment. But we want to go up a level to the system of systems idea within a factory. And I want to be able to integrate to that proprietary controller and to that proprietary controller. And then I want to slap on a bunch of extra sensors. For example, they make little sensors. You can put it on an electric motor, uh, a drive that uh, would record, again, vibration, heat, things like that, because I can begin to learn a lot. Acoustic sensors to hear all the different, you know, we know what a slipping belt sounds like on a car. But we could actually hear that with a sensor, too, or things like it, you know, things that go clunk in the night. So there is a tremendous amount of things happening right now in factories. Um, just an explosion of people rethinking factory automation by taking it up a level and, and trying to make it across an entire factory and then compare factory uh, A to factory B and so forth. One project uh, I'm working on, our company's working on in this area is uh, Denso which is the Japanese uh, automotive supplier. Um, they have a situation where, of course, they do a lot of production in Japan for the Japanese OEMs, but they do production around the world, too, in Korea and the US and so forth. And they don't understand why a process in the Japanese factory starts here and gets better, but a process in the US factory starts here and gets worse. And they say, we, just, we, we don't understand. There's something going on. It could be cultural, whatever, but we don't have any data. So we want to censor everything up, collect a lot of data, and try to figure out why the processes in the US drift over time when, in fact, they tighten up in Japan. So that's an example. And then uh, another thing about in, uh, manufacturing is just, again, this notion that you're never done. So you have to kind of think of uh, manufacturing being process, even where it used to be discrete, because you're never done. You have to think about how will you actually introduce changes into uh, products that are already out in the field doing their thing. And then uh, one more, you know, maybe the biggest change of all is the way things are serviced. In general, this notion of the industrial internet of things, when you put the word industrial in front of it, and, and by the way, if you look at uh, many reports like that McKinsey's written, 
they'll say 94% of the opportunity is in the industrial world. Like smart homes are neat, they're fun, I have one, but they don't actually move the needle much. If you look at big capital assets that last for many years, that consume tremendous amounts of electricity, uh, if you could make them more efficient, uh, fail less often, uh, operate more efficiently and so forth, you create lots of value. Um, so the ability to, uh, to drive higher levels of uptime and availability and then to optimize use of big capital assets is uh, you know, a, a critical driver, let's say, of uh, Internet of Things, and particularly industrial Internet of Things. Uh, so what do we do here? You see people uh, analyzing usage data um, to say, what's going on? How could I improve the design? How could I improve the service? How could I actually um, have them use the product differently? Uh, remote diagnostics and, and corrections, the ability to log into a turbine that's a thousand miles away and figure out what's the problem and tweak the bits a little bit and the problem goes away. It's just uh, another invaluable thing. And then the ability, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, to be able to take information into the field with you and use technologies like augmented reality to take you through the process of repairing something that you know needs to be repaired because you've been applying predictive analytics against its sensor streams is a, is a big, uh, powerful idea. So these are some of the examples of the ways that uh, service processes are changing. So our second article ended on this idea that there is an org chart that's pretty traditional. Uh, manufacturing companies have had an org chart like this for many, many years. The only uh, new piece really is uh, IT, and that's not that new. R&D here kind of means engineering, by the way. So uh, engineering, manufacturing, uh, marketing, sales, service, support, that's a traditional company. And if you were making uh, tennis rackets, that would work fine. But when you go to smart connected products, a couple of problems happen immediately, which is there is so much IT technology in the product. Who owns all that? Generally, engineering teams create the product, and IT teams support engineering, manufacturing, sales, everybody else, but now there's so much IT, and most engineers out there in the world don't know much about IT, to be frank. B being really good at tennis racket design is a very different skill set than being really good at a high performance, secure, um, you know, fault tolerant cloud architecture. That's a very different thing. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna put the IT department in charge of the uh, software parts of the product? Uh, are we going to teach the engineers how to do software? I mean, what's going on? It's a great opportunity, of course, for all of you. But today, in the real world, it's a huge problem. Uh, people generally have viewed the uh, IT department as sort of uh, a second-class citizen, to be frank. Your job is to support me. Most of your projects are overdue, over budget. I don't want you touching my brand new tennis racket. Stay the hell away. Um, but what's happening now is the engineering department have to admit they just don't have the talent. So there's no great answer to this problem. Companies are trying different things. But the net of it is they're trying to bring together classical, you know, mechanical, electrical engineering with serious uh, information technology. A second thing is uh, all this data and the analytics that could be done to it. Uh, some people have said data is the new oil. It's a, it's a commodity that, you know, has a lot of value but needs to be processed. So I say if all the data available to us is oil, then we're going to need a refinery. And we can only afford one refinery, so it would be great if we had one of them and it informed everybody. So just like you can convert crude oil into plastics, gasoline, diesel, whatever, we need to, we need to convert crude data uh, into you know, actionable business uh, implications. Whose job is it to do that? We're going to need somebody. Um, the third thing would be a, a concept software companies have called uh, DevOps. It's a contraction for development slash operations. Anytime you have a product that can be changed after it leaves the factory, you have uh, a great opportunity here, but also something you need to be careful with. I mean, you don't want to be fiddling bits in somebody's car when they're driving down the road and they end up getting in an accident because your upgrade didn't quite take place or, or what happened. So how do we go about changing fleets of products that are being used in very careful, safe ways? Okay. Like a Tesla, I believe, only updates in your garage at night when it's not being used. That's an example of being safe and careful. But even there, if I download a bug into your Tesla and tomorrow morning you can't make it to work, you're going to be a little angry. So i got to be very careful. The changes have to be pretty fail-proof. I have to figure out the right time to do it. Not everybody has their Tesla in the garage at the exact same point in time, so I'm going to have to schedule this. Well, it turns out cloud software companies have been doing that for a while. If you used 
something like Salesforce.com, which is a CRM, Customer Relationship Management System, they're updating it all the time. Uh, it changes you know, several times a week as they're updating it. But again, they've mastered how to be careful. And then the last piece um, is uh, a thing called Customer Success Management. So it used to be, if I bought a tennis racket like this and never used it, just threw it in the closet and two years I hadn't pulled it out, nobody would know I hadn't used it. But now you do know. You know everything about what's going on. So if you sell a product, particularly if you sell it with that business model where you pay for use, and the product's not being used or not being used correctly or not being used to the degree of utilization expected, you really have a kind of an opportunity here and a need to intervene and figure out what's the problem. So um, this too is something that cloud software companies do. Sort of re it's the proactive version of uh, DevOps. The point here though, um, what you see happening is that this new org chart ends up being a hybridization of a software company org chart and a traditional manufacturing company org chart. And you can't switch from one to the other because you still have to do all the traditional manufacturing things, but you now have to figure out how to live with a foot in both worlds, being a software company and a manufacturing company at the same time. It's a very, very, very big challenge right now uh, for companies. Okay, the third part, uh, and this will be the last part, is uh, what's going on with the human experience. So this is a Volvo XC90 automobile, it's smart and connected. If you're driving it, the physical interface looks like this. If you want to interact with the digital part of it, it looks like that. So if you want to log into it on your phone, you can, but you can't do much. And if you want to drive it, then you've got to put the phone in your pocket and drive it without the benefit of any of that capability. So I'm arguing you're either having the digital uh, experience or the physical experience, but not the converged experience, even though it's a converged product. So uh, naturally, you know, we can apply analytics and that helps, but we're still producing vastly more information than, uh, than humans can ingest. So if we try to put this information on your smartphone screen here, uh, I would argue that we have a very big pipe of data coming at you but a very small pipe going into the human brain. Anytime you have to look at your screen and read, I'm going to argue you're reading at three words per second. So we have 10 to the 21st times 70 of data being ingested into humans when you're reading at three words per second. And I get to that by saying um, most of us uh, can speak at three words per second. And I can prove that by saying 1,001. There, that's a second. 1,001. Um, most of us can't read faster than we can speak. If I hand you a paragraph of text you've never seen before, most people slow down as they're reading out loud, not speed up. Um, so I'm arguing you can read at three words per second, more or less, which is not very fast. Um, and so you have a very difficult time ingesting that data. So I want to talk about this concept of a different way to do it with uh, augmented reality. And this is where I'm going to switch to my uh, phone if I could. I want to show you a, a demo here. Now the basic premise of uh, augmented reality is to add digital information into the field of view. So I'm firing up my phone, I'm going to plug it in so you can see, and I'm running a piece of software, it would be the same thing just live, a piece of software here, um, thank you, a piece of software that we call a thing browser. So if a web browser helps you while, uh, browse web pages, a thing browser helps you browse things. So when I point it at this pump here, th this pump I should have mentioned by the way, um, is a uh, 3D printed piece of plastic, but it is uh, from the CAD model of a hydraulic pump on a Bobcat skid steer uh, material handling equipment. So this would be a, a real physical product. I'm going to say load that experience. So it is. And uh, what it does here is it turns this into a digital physical sort of experience. So if you see the thing I have in my hand, is a little bit different than the thing I'm showing on the screen. Hopefully you can see all that. And uh, because what I'm doing here is I'm capturing a video of it and then augmenting that video. So for example, I could say, go get some data from our business systems. Who owns it? Is it under warranty? What serial number? And so forth. I might jump to this third button and say, what's going on with it? And it's uh, telling me here. Um, the sensor readings, you know, some temperature is 82, the uh, RPM is 68, whatever, and the uh, oil pressure is 4.2 or something like that. So I'm augmenting gauges onto the physical thing. Let me turn that off. I could um, say, show me how to take it apart. 
here's that bleed valve, and then if you watch the uh, green bolts come out and the, and the casting slide back. And then show me how to put it back together where the casting fits there and the bolts fit there. And there's that bleed valve. And then here's the uh, hydraulic fittings. So that's an example of a service procedure being augmented onto it. And then if I uh, jump to this I, the fourth button over, it turns out that this, because I said it's 3D printed, I'm turning on my X-ray vision and I'm using the CAD model to see that this isn't a solid piece of plastic, there's a lattice structure inside. So it turns out that uh, when you 3D print something this big, you don't want to make it solid because it takes too long, you're wasting too much material and it's too heavy. Um, now, in the real world, this wouldn't have this lattice structure because it would have a subassembly of you know, rotor inside and so forth. But anyway, I'm trying to show you here the lattice structure uh, inside that model by simply positioning the CAD model of the lattice structure at the right place in the, uh, in the physical product. So that's an example of uh, augmented reality. Just to give you kind of a visual introduction, if you've uh, not played with technology like that before, if we could switch back. Okay. Okay. So that, the idea there is, uh, comes from the notion that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I think most people would agree a, a picture really is worth a thousand words. In fact, as a mental exercise, just imagine, you can do it or not, if you close your eyes, you open them up for one second, look at me and close them again, You'll see me, you'll get some information about me, I'm about this tall and I'm wearing a sport coat and so forth. But you also notice that there's a screen here and there and that you're in a room and there are many other people in the room and you think you recognize some of those people, you recognize what room you're in, there's things up on the ceiling, there appears to be a light source in the back from the window. I mean, your brain can take so much information in one second, um, which to me really is that picture's worth a thousand words. If you could remember it all, it would take you at least a thousand words to describe the richness of what you saw. Okay. So if you believe a picture is worth a thousand words, then I'm going to argue your brain can process at least 60 pictures a second. And I say that because the monitor I'm looking at right now is running at 60 hertz, which means it's painting 60 pictures a second. And when any little pixel changes, I see it. I see which ones did change and I see which ones didn't change. So now we're saying, wait a minute, a thousand words, 60 times a second? That's 60,000 words per second as opposed to three when I was reading text. Now, if I'm looking at this screen, even while I'm watching a video here, moving pictures, I still see there's a room around me. So my peripheral vision is much bigger than the screen. I can actually see many, uh, I, I did a quick uh, math calculation, not sure I did it right, but I was looking for the equation of a hemisphere and saying if what I can see is a hemispherical view from the floor to the ceiling and left to right, you know, I can see both of my hands right now while looking straight ahead and I can do the same thing like that. My quick calculation, and I gotta check this with somebody, is basically this screen is one four hundredth of what I can see. So if I could actually watch 400 times more than 60 pictures per second, wow. You're now at 7.9 million times faster ingestion of data than reading text at three words per second. So where I'm going with this is we think that humans have a huge pipe if you can figure out how to tap into it. And that's the ability to process data that you instantly recognize through your peripheral vision without staring at it and reading it. If you could do that, then you're able to process incredible amounts of information. So this is how humans enter the picture, the world of physical digital convergence, how we make it physical digital human convergence. We take the screen, we don't hold the phone out here, instead we put it on our glasses. And um, you're probably familiar with a number of different manufacturers. The Microsoft HoloLens are quite cool, uh, quite interesting, but there are others. And we're able to put information in your field of view without you even thinking about it. So I wanna show you a little video here, conceptually what we're talking about. So this guy's an airplane pilot, a small airplane, and he's wearing uh, Epson BT200 glasses. And I'll tell you what, this video, quite frankly, is a little bit doctored. It's not exactly what he sees. It's better than what he sees, because I have those glasses. Uh, they're not that good. Not near as good as the HoloLens. But what we're trying to do is bring information. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to turn the sound off. Can we turn the sound off? All right, it's fine. I'll just. So we're bringing information into his field of view. There we go. And, and we're decorating the field of view. That blue stripe up there is called a Victor Flyway. I'm a pilot, by the way. Um, so that is a highway in the sky, and these 
these purple boxes are the bounding boxes. Like, just stay within them and you'll be fine. And now you're going to see these green triangles are uh, GPS waypoints. That's traffic, meaning another airplane going by. Uh, we're going to show you some airspace here in a second. This is Class D airspace at Los Alamitos. The special rules about entering Class D airspace. You've got to contact the tower first and so forth. And now we're augmenting where the runway is and which airport. It's uh, KTOA. And here we are down to the runway. And, and in the meantime, we're putting information at the, I, I stopped it here. But at upper left and upper right have uh, information about the uh, runway lengths and you know this, that, and the other thing, angles, whatnot. So why I showed you this is it's the best representation I have that I can show you on a, on a video of what it would mean to gather data from the world around you, run it through analytics, and then decorate the world around you so that everything you need to see, you can see without even thinking about it. And you can process it using that super fast peripheral vision uh, intuitive processing system that humans have that's, uh, that's so incredible. And if we did that, then according to my math, and I got to check the math a little more, it'd be 7.9 million times faster ingestion of data on the human side. So we're pretty excited about that, uh, especially when you apply these two things together. Gather data from the physical world, run some of it up through analytics and so forth, but also gather a view of the world and then augment that view and show people the view that's augmented by data and analytics and things they need to know and let that uh, new humans, human experience really, uh, really take off. Okay, so my closing slide here. Um, you know, my, my advice for future engineers, and you know, this is entirely personal based on what's worked for me, um, but the first thing is do things you're interested in and passionate about. I mean, hopefully you sense if nothing else, I'm interested in this stuff. I mean, I really am, and people always say, my God, you're so passionate, and I say, it's because it's so awesome. Like, I want to go to work. I want to work on this stuff. It's fun. I like it. We're doing big, bold things. You know, I'm, uh, I'm energized. The second thing is uh, be curious. Um, this is a problem we have with our long-tenured employees. They stop being curious. They just assume tomorrow is just like yesterday, and they just come to work and go through the motions. And I say, the world around you is changing all the time, and this change is opportunity. It's a threat, too, by the way, but it's an opportunity. And it's the reason why, you know, the Nest thermostat didn't come from Honeywell. It's because people just couldn't imagine actually implementing that big of a change to think of thermostats working differently. Um, a point, you know, that probably came up here in the talk is a lot of really interesting stuff, and certainly in my career, has happened at domain intersections. I'm just talking about, like, cross-discipline. Uh, kind of programs and research and so forth. You know, for me, to love computer science and engineering at the same time got me into an industry. Then to think about, oh my God, that industry times the internet and the web would get me to a different industry. And I got from there to smart connected products by saying, wow, now the internet's moving into the products and wow, that's another opportunity. And then from there to augmented reality by thinking about, wow, if we could give this information to humans differently, it'd be incredible. So it's been exciting. But a lot of the excitement, at least for me personally, has happened when you, know, you take A times B and you get something really, really more interesting than A or B was uh, by itself. The fourth point would be that digital will infiltrate everything. I mean, if it's in a tennis racket, it's going to be everywhere. So that's kind of the takeaway there. I think everybody here needs to figure out digital. I mean, that's just my advice. You can take it or leave it. Um, but you know, my, my advice is there is no longer any such thing as classical engineering. It's, it's everything times digital and sometimes times each other because, of course, digital gets you into mechanic and electronic and, and so forth as well. And then one last point, uh, and then we'll see if we have time for questions, is uh, learn how to communicate. And, and I said that's because it's the only way people know you. It turns out when I graduated from college, I couldn't give a presentation to three people without getting so nervous I couldn't talk. I taught myself how. And um, you probably think I'm comfortable doing it. Actually, I'm terrified. I woke up this morning and said, damn, I wish I didn't have to go give that presentation. But that's OK. I'm just going to muster up the strength one more time to go do it. Um, because it's not my forte. It's, I'm not good at it. Um, that's why I didn't want to tell a joke. I actually am, I suck at jokes. <laughs> But if you want me to communicate passionately about technology and make you want to buy something or fund my project or whatever, oh, I'm pretty good at that. I just got to get going, right? So that to me is a, is a key final point here, which is, you know, people will only know you by what you said, what you wrote, what you presented, whatever. And to the extent you can't do that well, 
they won't know you very well. And, and that certainly will be a uh, career limiting factor. All right, that's the uh, end of my talk. I don't know if there's any questions or comments. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things that the AR technology in particular does is it enables a lot of people to do things that they aren't otherwise equipped to do. Remote medicine, for example, somebody was talking about uh, dentist, dentistry, where you have the, uh, the hygienist out in the field and the actual uh, medical you know, dental doctor somewhere far away, but they can see what's going on and interact. So I think on one hand, we're going to enable people to do things that they weren't otherwise trained to do, like uh, assembly workers or something like that. But on the jobs thing, I don't have a good answer for that, except for it's inevitable. It, I mean, it is. So you're doing a good thing. You're setting yourself up to participate in the new world. If you think about over the millennia, how many cultures have been run over by somebody who's moving on to the next level? Almost all of them, to be frank. And the idea that we're going to keep um, manual jobs because we have a big pool of labor that likes to have manual jobs, it's just not going to happen. Those companies will go out of business, the proverbial buggy whips. You know, when, when, when mankind went from driving horses and carriages to horseless carriages, you didn't need a buggy whip anymore. You know, that's old story. I mean, you just can't save the buggy whip industry. You can't. You can retrain people uh, so they can participate in the new industry. And certainly a younger generation of people can be smart enough to go into career fields that, that really take them into the future. But I don't have a good answer. I mean, you know, we can get into presidential politics or something here. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's no good answer. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment about what you might see this, how this, this might affect the ownership model. I mean, in, just in terms of like, for example, if John Deere sells me a tractor, you know, and they want to put the biggest motor in there and I pay the smallest price, they probably aren't going to be happy if I turn it on to bigger motor version. I also rely on all of the cloud services that, you know, that they're there tomorrow and the next day and the day after. So I'm not even sure I really own this tractor anymore. I'd like to yeah. be using it. Yeah. Well, I don't, they won't let you change the, uh, the, the horsepower unless you hack into it, which maybe you're capable of. But, uh, but let me just say, in general, this idea of paying for the use of the product rather than buying the asset of the product, you know, some people call that the sharing economy, of course. And uh, there's a couple of things that really happen, potentially, with the sharing economy approach. One is the total demand goes down because we have many assets that are very poorly utilized. I mean, that's the Uber story, is that, is that the average car sits parked 23 hours a day. And it's an expensive asset. So do we all need to own those expensive, uh, low-utilized assets, or could we share them with something like Uber? The second thing, though, that's very interesting, and you should think about this, is the whole uh, onus shifts back to the manufacturer. So I'll give an example. If I, uh, let's take John Deere. It's not a serious example here in this case, so far as I know. But if I sold you tractors, and those tractors break down occasionally, and I have to send a technician out, and he's going to sell you some replacement parts and so forth. A lot of the times, the back-end service generates vast amounts of revenue and profit. So, so the fact that your product fails occasionally, uh, you know, I apologize a lot, but I'm making a lot of money fixing it, so I, I, I kind of leave with a smile. Um, but if you didn't buy it, if every time it fails, it's on me because now nobody can use it and they can't pay me because it's not working, then I would completely change the engineering approach. I would say, we've got to make tractors that don't fail. And then we have to use analytics to understand when they would fail and to intervene and keep them from failing because whether or not the asset is utilized now is my profit. So I got to do everything I can to keep that asset working and available and highly utilized and so forth. So it is actually very interesting because 
and Porter and I uh, talked about this in the first paper, we think actually you could drive vast amounts of waste, uh, all forms of waste, out of the ecosystem by switching to uh, models that promote higher levels of utilization, as opposed to selling more things whether you need them or not. Um, I just have a question about the automation thing. Again, so you mentioned that there's different degrees of automation. Clearly, we've already achieved a few of those lower degrees. Um, just where do you see the future of that complete automation just years down the road? Um, like what do you predict it might look like? And, and as far as the human experience as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead and look. Not even sure where to start with that one. I mean, I, I think it will get us, it, it will take us a long time to get to the point where we have semi trucks that don't need drivers or, or even cars that don't need drivers and so forth because there, there are flaws in most of the automation approaches today, which uh, actually aren't funny at all if taken to scale. You know, like my truck does a good job of staying between the lanes until I get on a piece of new highway where it hasn't been painted yet, and then, I'm, then I die if I'm not ready to grab control, right? So it's those kind of things that, that there are too many end cases. And in fact, on the human experience things, one of the things in this uh, third paper we're studying is fundamentally what are humans good at and what are machines good at. And it turns out there's one flaw in machines which to this date has not been well solved, and that is they can't deal with novel situations. You know what I mean? As long as you're driving and the road's striped perfectly, my, my system works fine, but you get to the point where it's new pavement or I'm on a gravel road or, you know, oh my God, I don't know what to do. The algorithm wasn't programmed for that. Humans just make it up in a pretty good, fast way. Machines can't. So I think anytime you need creativity, ingenuity, exposed to a certain set of circumstances for the first time, we will struggle to automate it to the point where a driverless vehicle can, you know, solve that or something like that. I think it'll take a while. But I also think there's a good chart out on this that I think maybe ZF did, ZF slash TRW, um, which said that they, they took uh, drive, you know, uh, ve autonomous vehicles and they broke it into six levels of autonomy, right? In the example I described with my vehicles, like level three of six, you know, six means the human can go to sleep, uh, the vehicle's doing everything. But I think that's, in my view, that's quite far away. Let's, uh for the interest of time, if you have questions, you can come down and talk to Jim. But uh, let's thank our speaker and thank you for a wonderful talk. Great, thank you.